All right, guys, welcome to the show. Uh, we have a special guest tonight. And let me. There we go. That's where we wanted it. Um, we're going to do a few things tonight. First thing, and yes, it, it is going to be a party. Uh, Shadow, Randy, Tim, Skyblazer, what's going on? Of course, uh, George Watts, Kevin, and I saw Ethan earlier. EQ, what's going on? Um, so we've got Alpha via Skype, uh, via audio. So Alpha, go hey ahead and say hi. Hi. And behind me, I've got... An F-35, which Alpha designed, of course. And if you look really close in the exhaust, I finally got that fire booty installed. Yeah, there's Alpha in the chat there, too. Text and audio. Awesome. Double tap. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. What's going on, Wild Bill? What's going on, Tim? Hey, Rick. Welcome to the stream. Looks like you do not have a wrench, so we'll introduce you properly. What's going on, Dave Marshall? Howdy, Dave. What's going on, Mikey? Hey, Chuck GRC. Welcome, sir. Nice, George. Yeah, that's right. Uh, George put together the T-33, which, honestly, I have to say is probably, of the, the larger flying EDF jets, my favorite. It is, by far and away, the most locked in right off the bat, and it's a big jet, too. <laughs> yes, I do, Shadow. Well aware. <laughs> What does double tap mean in the military? Oh, um, my entire family's military. <laughs> what's going on, Dan? Got some new people in here tonight, so you got to welcome them properly, of course. Hey, Ethan. What's going on, Guniac? I would... Man, what what's the F-35 comparable to? Hmm. I don't know. I think... How would you describe that, Alpha? Probably the F five. If we're turn if talking in terms of overall flight envelope, um, power set, what have you, it's likely closer to the F five, certainly closer to the F five than it would be to uh, the A six or say to the seventy millimeter hawk. So gotcha. it's right in that pocket of go fast, stay stable, um, it likes rudder input. <clears throat> Yep. But other than that, overall, really approachable. Yeah, it's it's a fun jet, guys, especially when you get used to it and you get the hey, center Craig. of gravity tuned in how you want it. What's going on, Craig? Um, yeah, man, it's it's awesome. I really, I've got the, the elevator set pretty high. So, man, the turns that you can do with that, I know that uh, F-35 isn't known as one that has a tight turn radius in the scale jet, but I like flying mine heavy throttle and heavy turns yeah good speed yeah dave marshall the uh, i'm talking about i should clarify talking about the f5 in its current configuration with the uh with a high power setup okay and the older with the when i first designed that f5 five years ago now six years ago now uh that aircraft used the 1750 outrunner and um you know good airplane for the time but the high power system we're using it now really wakes it up you don't need as much throttle anymore, at least. I am definitely liking uh, that in runner and that F thirty five. I've thought about getting uh, one of those in runners. I know that you now have in the seventy millimeter Hawk. Uh, you've got the, uh, basically it's the same EDF in that one, right? Yeah, it's the same in runner. Now, now that we sort of standardized around that, I like that power set for most of the aircraft. We're going to be rolling it into uh, some of the other birds. So nice. People seem to really like the F-35 as far as economy, um, overall flight envelope, yep. your speed, your consumption. It seems to be a nice sweet spot for in the context of 70s. So. 
Yeah, and and it handles the wind better than than even some of my eighties. Like the, yeah, it, it's got that. It's, it just it flies a little heavier. Flies more like a heavier yeah. warbird. Absolutely. But if you play play it right, that's an advantage. Yeah, I always tell pilots energy management. I mean, yep. You don't uh, you don't you're you're just burning watts if if you're accelerating zero to a hundred throttle from a level uh, attitude straight vertical. There's a ways to sort of use that energy to surf you know, surf the skies and and uh, take advantage of the airframe. But you're absolutely right. The F-35 being that little heavier overall wing loading, it penetrates better. So for pilots who know how to fly like that, that's where you're really seeing 100 plus mile an hour speeds and still being able to come down at the four minute plus mark. 100%. So. Yeah, the flight times are great. And and I've only flown 4,000s, um, like my Admiral uh, Pro 4,000s. And I've got some N-Fan. <laughs> Uh, 4200s, but they're basically almost the exact same footprint and very similar discharge rate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Joe, I saw Joe Habib. Welcome, sir. You get a wrench. Yeah, the connection is, is holding well now, or, or for now, Alpha. It's been nice and clear. Alpha and I were chatting a little bit pre-show. Yep, and, uh, yep. One of the things that, that jump in. we definitely want to to get out there, and and I've mentioned on a few other streams, but something that's important, given the scenario of what's going on out there in the world and and production and supply chains and things like that, Hobby Squawk is a really good resource for you guys. Um, it's linked off Motion RC's website, but go, I think it's HobbySquawk.com, correct? Absolutely. Yep. Go there, check it out. Um, I've posted there off and on for years. There's some really cool guys there too. Like, it seems like there's a there's some people that post on RC groups, which is where I've historically been because I started mostly in um, Horizon Hobby planes, things like that. Um, but I definitely enjoy going and, and enjoying the character there at, at Hobby Squawk. Yeah, especially now that we're all going to be locked in for the next couple of weeks or longer, we might yeah. as well. Knock, knock on wood. Any forum. Any forum, any place we can talk about anything we're doing. In my book, it's all it's all good. I mentioned Hobby Squawk only just because, from a logistical, practical standpoint, I don't have the bandwidth to um, to sort of be in all five of the major hobby forums every day. So Hobby Squawk is one of those ones that I can just reach out to, try and stay close to our friends and family around the world, and try and give people answers for all the stuff we got coming. Um, you know, barring that, of course, RC groups, RC universe, all the other forums, they're we're all good as long as we're talking about what we love guys exactly that's that's the most important thing whether we can go outside and fly or fly stuff inside or do some modeling inside for those of you lucky people that got your tanks early on um mm -hmm. that's Bang. you guys are going to have some fun projects like if you saw wesley's show this last weekend man he he did some killer killer uh, weathering and whatever I'm not sure what you, you call all that stuff, but because I'm a noob, like <clears throat> not even a noob at that kind of stuff. I've never really done it, but it's pretty awesome. Yeah, not yeah. your Corona. Good That's time. awesome. <laughs> What's going on, Wreck'em Roy? So, Cods with Guns, a fast UMX. Are you thinking just like a, a Horizon Hobby UMX or a smaller RC plane? Because there, there are They're some... They're faster if you fly them in the living room. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it depends on the space that you're flying them in, right? Some things that really don't go that fast outside really, really seem fast inside this living room right here. Yeah, Lee Davidson's right. The UMX MIG or the UMX Habu, if it's still around, that yeah, one's I think, good. I think that you might be able to get it used, but I think they sold out of that one for a bit. Uh, one other really good... Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, man, I'm. Th I want that uh, people to know more about that Lippish P15. I think that is a great small rig. I'm not sure about your flying skills codes with guns, but if if you're also oh, you fly 3D foamies, yeah, you might be able to handle one of those. UMX A10's not bad. That's true. Loud as I'll get out, but. 
That's good. Yeah. Yeah, it is a screamer, isn't it? She's a screamer. I ended up selling my, my UMX A10 to Rick and Roy's. I, I can't remember if it was him or his buddy. I thought it was just to Roy because I gave him the Roy discount, but um, I think it was to his friend. The UMX Timber, well, they don't have a UMX Timber X just yet. Um, I'm not sure if they will or not, but I have a UMX Turbo Timber that I still need to maiden. But I have the original Turbo, uh, original Timber, and it's pretty awesome. I love the lights, all sorts of stuff that that thing has. Josh Weaver, are you following my Instagram? Your face looks familiar. Yeah, he does. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> He's pretty active. And and his show uh, led into this. And thank you, Josh, for all the lead-ins. Hopefully that salute's looking better than it did a few weeks ago, a few months ago for sure. What's going on, Dustin? Hey, Raven. <sighs> Dustin checking in. A lot of guys on here. Yeah. So is everyone just, are we all just sitting in our respective living rooms, our hangers? Just... Pretty much. I did post this on a few more groups than I normally do. So I, I've, I generally just haven't really done that that much, but the last couple of weeks I've spread it around, and then today I did just a little bit more than, than normal. What's going on, John Noons? Um, yeah, because I wanted a little, little extra action in here, and that was even before we talked earlier, actually, so... Good call, Lee. In the living room, avoiding Corona. That is something I, you know, I I'm hoping, and then also not hoping that that my work kind of shuts the doors for a few weeks and sees where everything goes with that over here because it's it's getting hairy. There's a local uh, waitress at a cafe here in town, and this is a small town for you guys that don't know. We're probably in. We, the numbers are really all over the place, but I, it's a little over 15,000, most likely. And it's kind of spread out, very rural. You guys have seen where I fly, and that's kind of the, the west end of town. Still in the city limits, but uh, west end of town. Anyhow, a 20-year-old tested positive for it, and she was you know, serving food and all that stuff. So who knows how many people she polluted over in the last few weeks. So we're going to buckle up our, our seat belts and see where it goes so yeah guys yep. check out alpha's instagram it he's posting a lot of good stuff factory stuff um i think he even posted some stuff for the f-35 there you go it's always in reverse so i gotta kind of like fly <laughs> inverted here yeah so i'm uh, i'm not a social guy <clears throat> believe it or not i'm very i'm actually very shy very private i prefer prefer my actions to speak for themselves but um i'm told that <clears throat> a lot of people are on social these days i think i'm about 10 years late so this is my this is my effort to try and give us a bit of a behind the scenes people seem to like when we did the free wing walkthrough video on that ocean rc's awesome. live a month ago so i went and just walked through and took my camera made a video and people liked it so on my Instagram, you're not going to see what I'm eating for breakfast. I'm not one of those guys, but uh, hopefully I can give people sort of a look at what we're working on, what's coming, what a factory looks like. You know, we're working with 50 plus factories these days. So what sort of wow. what that side of the hobby looks like? Um, it's not rocket science. It's well, it's aerodynamics, but. <laughs> But it's still sort of nice to see, I think people would like to see sort of how that model in front of them or behind them is actually produced. And so, oh. or we can, uh, or we can open the curtain a bit, we can. Yeah, I think Disclaimer awesome. is that I'm, I am not a social guy. I'm not, uh, VPN access obviously is very difficult for Google and YouTube and, and Instagram and, and uh, Facebook and all these other social media platforms where I'm at. But, um. When the VPN holds, we'll try and give you all some pictures, see what my life looks like. That is cool, man. I I have thoroughly enjoyed it. You're also very responsive on there, too. It's it's really cool, man. The, just the access that you guys, and then being on the show tonight, too. And I know you've been on, uh, I think, Wesley's show, too. And, of yeah. course, on Motion's show, uh, the live stream that they just started. If you guys haven't caught it, I know some of you guys may be working at that time, but... 
I'm able to, I listen to podcasts in the background when I'm plugging away at the computer off to the side of my smartphone. So a lot of times I can get away with doing that and still be productive at work. And man, I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, what James has been doing each week. Friday morning, uh, 9 a.m. West Coast time. Of course, that's noon on East Coast time. Yep. And then do the math wherever you are. I'm sure you're used to using those as your barometers, of course. Yeah, exactly. So there's, um, you know, we're doing our best. I, the love, lovely thing I think about modern, you could say this modern internet culture is we can reach out. People around the world can sort of connect with each other. If it's raining, if it's snowing, if there's a virus outside, we can still sort of have fun in some sort of way. For and sure. yeah, there's nothing wrong, never going to be anything wrong with that. Definitely. It's it's awesome. I, and I, I love how some of us guys have started to do streams and really connect with the audience. Like, I'm, you know, I've been pushing 20,000 subs for a while and did that long before I was uh, doing the streams. In fact, Wesley, right about the time that Pilot Ryan Media had his uh, one-year anniversary, um, I think it was last July-ish, somewhere in that time frame, I was like, oh, heck no. I'm not getting in front of the camera because that's just not really my nature. I'm the man behind the scenes doing kind of what James does, only more behind the scenes sort of a deal and Mm -hmm, with other mm -hmm. people up front. But Wesley kind of, you know, he made it easy for me to to get in front of the camera, and then Ryan did a great job too. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm like, okay, well, maybe, maybe. And then Dustin, Raven Rock Machine and Aviation, he sent me a, a webcam. Hilarious joke, actually. It was uh, both functional and really funny because that's Dustin, just top to bottom. And let's circle back to his F14 thing uh, here in a minute. So I want to give him a little props on that. Uh, but he sent it, and it said uh, my full name and then stripper cam on it, like on the package. He bought it from Amazon and sent it to me. I thought it was a T-shirt that, that he told me about, so I opened it. I'm like, what is – what? And then it was a, a webcam, so I did a, a test run, and then uh, Fred Barron and, and some other awesome guys were in there. And Fred Barron gave me a super chat, and I'm like, okay. I'm going to try this and, and see where this takes me. And, of course, many weeks later, here we are. Yeah, here we are. So it all sort of works out naturally. Things just come okay. together. <laughs> 100%. So, and have you seen those brackets that Dustin made? I haven't. So he yeah. made some, some updated brackets. He's a machining guy, which is why he's got uh, the... Raven Rock machining and, and such in his YouTube channel, but he built these brackets uh, to to add something. I can't. I'm not a detail guy as far as that goes, but um, these metal brackets to put the landing gear into to help make it a little more robust. And he worked with what's his name, uh, Rich Rich Baker. So him and Rich Baker uh, made these these deals, and he's shown it on the show a few times. But pretty awesome stuff. Yeah. Oh, you're talking. To, I'm sorry. I was, I was thinking of a different type of bracket. You're talking about the main gear distribution. Yes. Bracket. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Rich and I, uh, Rich RC and former good guy, good Definitely. sort of head on his shoulders when it comes to designing these types of things. Real life airline pilot. So he went back and forth three o'clock in the morning in China with me, sending me photos. What about this? And how about this? And does this work? And I said, What you're doing is great. Run with it. And, you know, you, you don't need me. <laughs> You know what you're doing, and uh, he came up with a good solution for for people who are in who find themselves sort of in that pocket. Um, you know, four years, thousands of aircraft, as is, so they're sort of fine. But we recognize there are always those people in certain conditions who are going to want to do something else. And even going back to Guniac or RC Geek, yep. developing something like <laughs> Fire Booty or yeah, <laughs> Center Burner, go. whatever we're going to call it. You know, that's just we're just we're doing our part, giving you all airplanes. You guys take it and run with it. Do whatever you want. And I think that's uh, that's that's always fun to see. Yeah, definitely. And, and I have to say that, you know, I got the, the BAE Hawk, I think it was uh, October of 18, and didn't fly it because I was chicken and kept making excuses. And then February, I finally maidened it, and it went well. Because there's a bit of a jump from, like, your 3S... 
um, EDF, like my F-18 sitting there in the corner, to a, a he bigger and heavier 6S EDF jet. There's more responsibility, there's more energy management, you need more space to take off and land, there's all that. But my main mm -hmm. went really, really well, better than I thought. In fact, my, one of my buddies, Derek, um, he, he said something along the lines of, of man, that's, you know, I'm not, it'll push you to your limit. And part of that was correct. But when I landed, I was so elated with how that went. I yelled out, take that, Derek. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, if you watch the video, you hear that at the end and, and probably have a little more context with that. But I, I didn't even think about it. I just yelled that out because I was just so excited. It's such a rush. And ever since then, I really haven't bought much other than 6S EDF jets. There's been a few things in between to add, you know, diversity of content on my channel. But for the most part, man, it's it's just been those 6S EDF jets. And of course, I expanded to the L39, have the A4 Skyhawk. So we've got some 80 millimeters. And then of course, most recently the T33. And you guys, before it sells out, if you're thinking about that camo one, I would check that out sooner than later because, man, yeah, I'm not sure about the, the inventory on that, but I would guess that the way that those tanks have gone. Always low. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet, man, because that's killer. And those those 64 millimeter jets are awesome, too. Uh, before uh, we went live, I was telling Alpha how much I love that Lippish P-15. It is just a killer jet. It's fast the flight envelope is insane you can just pot along and it the glide is insane on that but it also did, how fast i haven't radared that one yet but how fast do you think realistically that one goes i'm thinking near uh, triple digits but i don't know it's near triple digits if you fly it flying downwards and towards your face it feels like it's faster than it is oh yeah and it because it's smaller so it, yep. it definitely feels Every bit as fast as that F thirty five. Your right speed's there. going to be different from its uh, perceived speed. <laughs> yeah, perceived speed is different, and and that F thirty five is quick too. I mean, it's it's fun, man. I love turning and burning, and yeah, it's good stuff. So what I think we're going to do next is we're going to fire up that fire booty, and and show you guys what that's all about. It might shake some stuff. I'm gonna move my adult grape juice off to the side here so I don't knock that over because this, the thrust on this thing is powerful, guys. I may need to secure a couple other things. I didn't think this- You're right, RC Air Marshal. The, the sort of power to weight ratio on average for these 80 millimeter 6S birds, especially now that we've migrated into the in-runner space, say on like a T33, it's, it's um it's better better is a weird word to say but it but it is certainly observably different than it would be on a 90 millimeter 6s uh, if you take a 90 millimeter f16 which i designed seven years ago six years ago now compared to the 80 millimeter t33 6s um it's just it's almost night and day so that's what we're trying to do I'm trying to move that needle that's awesome and you know, I my buddy Odell, shout out to Odell. I'm not sometimes he catches these shows, sometimes he doesn't. He's the pilot in uh, my F14 videos that have quite a few video or uh, quite a few views. And same with those F16 videos when he's flying the crap out of that one that you designed seven years ago or whatever. Um, great pilot. He's a, it was actually an army helicopter pilot, and he he got me into jets, man. All right, so come. let me get set up here real quick. I'm going to move the chair to the side. Hopefully my audio will extend. If not, I'll just unplug real quick. And guys, shout out to the Motion RC lanyard. This thing, I've ordered a bunch of lanyards in the past, and I got this the other day with the package back there that I got for my birthday for myself. This is nice thick and robust so consider getting one for yourself
Ethan, you're right. I do think the Flightline Corsair is the perfect, uh, perfect size Corsair. <laughs> That's why I made it that way. I happen to be deeply biased. I think I'm going to kill... Nah, we'll probably be able to see it just fine. I was going to say, let's kill the lights, but we really don't need to. Yeah, it'll overexpose. Yeah, what I really need to do is make sure I hang on to this jet, so... Oh yeah, stuff blew everywhere. You're toasting the microphone, <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> so you guys want some thrust? There you go, bitches. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I'm going to have to clean up a big mess here when I'm done, but that was that was worth it. Oh, crap, and I found a Cabela's gift card that I forgot about. This is my desk. I've got a bunch of bills and stuff under here, so. Oh, yeah. So, guys, let me drop the link to, to, um, to Guniac's Afterburner here. Check him out on Facebook. Yeah, check him out. Yeah, that thing's awesome. He's he's got uh, for pretty much all your motion RC planes. Uh, he's got you you figured out. Same thing with the E flight ones, I believe. Um, I know that some of the the um, outrunners, not all of those fit just right. So check with him and see what works. I may actually, I really love my uh, Bayhawk, that 70 millimeter. It's such a nice jet, just like this one, just to toss in the trunk. It fits great and just go when you've got just a limited amount of time and you don't have to take off a wing, anything like that to fit in my little car. So I, I'm seriously considering upgrading the motor to the inrunner in that. And, uh, and if you don't have one yet, get the high performance one, guys. It does have a lot of power uh, stock though. So how, you know, I, will ha I wonder Alpha, and maybe you can answer this question or not, with that Hawk, with the in runner, the high performance, what's the main difference between the high performance and then the, the one that's been out for a while? Uh, in the Hawk specifically, the primary difference you're gonna see is in your static acceleration. Okay. So when you're, when you're on the ground, if you're, if you're on grass, for example, you're going to get up and go faster. Okay. Um, that is that is usually always an advantage, but it's more observable in the hawk just because of how its intakes are configured and other things like where the wing is sitting relative to the ground and all that sort of math. Um, the other advantage you're going to get with any inrunner is a potentially higher top speed, the way we've pitched the impeller and sort of the KV we settled at. But really what we tell, try and tell people is it's, it's really not about your, your peak airspeed at any given time. The ad main advantage of inrunners is that if you fly them sort of correctly or, or in a certain way, you're going to unlock significantly longer flight times. Um, that isn't okay. because, that is, that's actually not because at any given time their average peak amperage is going to be higher than, than, uh, than an outrunner, but it they're able to get up and go, so to speak, okay. um, and reach that cruising speed uh, faster uh, and at a lower throttle setting. Now, that only works if once you get to that speed, you back off the throttle. Gotcha. Um, that's how you're able to mathematically reduce your average consumption over the course of, you know, four or five minutes. 20% um, reduction in time and consumption is going to add a minute of flight time. So, so the best way to sort of phrase is in runners have the potential to fly faster in spurts and have a higher uh, cruise speed at a lower throttle setting okay. if they're flown how they want to be. Gotcha. At the same time, you know, if you took 
two Hawks, both with in runners, and you, you gave them the identical batteries, you could run that battery down faster than you would at an outrunner because it's pulling more amps. Just okay. math. Gotcha. Um, but but I can sort of, you know, a good pilot would be able to take that aircraft and sort of be able to do a, a wider flight profile and still end up um, a, a bit longer than, say, an outrunner. So um, nothing... My point in all this, guys, is I think as most of us know, we can't take specs for granted and can't assume that the specs alone will compensate for um, for piloting. Sure. People always say, uh, how can I get double the flight time? Well, double or, or, or have your consumption, however you get at that. Um, loading up the aircraft with a lot of batteries isn't always the answer because you run into wing loading constraints. But um, it always comes down to sort of it's just the math. I want to triple my flight times. Well, you're you're not going to because you can't reduce your consumption by that much. Gotcha. Um, and all that sort of stuff. That's awesome. That's awesome perspective. Because for me, I learned to fly on ultra micros just out in the field, right up by my house, and you know, just literally kind of getting a feel for it, just flying by feel, and then. I've kind of reverse engineered what I've learned with that and then try and uh, put stuff from my brain to my fingers uh, as a result moving forward when I've gotten into more complex stuff, less forgiving stuff like EDF jets. So that's yeah. good to hear. Yep. Yeah, with in-runners, it, it's, it should be nice because once you're sort of underway, you're going to have a bit more acceleration. Um, so that helps for bailout power, you know, brown pants power. Yeah. <laughs> that's always handy because and i will say that for me i generally don't fly full throttle with most stuff so um not having to go full throttle as long to get off and get your airspeed up that fred baron thank you very much dude appreciate yeah. that thanks fred by the way josh answered and asked an interesting question josh weaver rc uh, have we tried testing or considered dual stage EDFs? I presume you mean inline EDFs. Um, the short answer is we've we haven't ever reached the prototyping phase because the math it never pencils out. You know, you, you're ramming, you're trying to in um, attract or induce airflow, and somehow trying to compress it in some meaningful way to then push it into an EDF directly behind it. Um, we're just we're not running the RPMs, um, nor are we sort of configured with the rake angles on our impellers and other types of uh, variables to really take advantage of something like that. So short answer is no. Um, this isn't a traditional turbofan, for example, where you're stacking discs and and there's there's a there's an advantage uh, in compressing the air. That's not that's not what we're after. We're just after efflux, which is just air in and accelerate outwards, and um, without having to rely on compression so that's why <laughs> if you wondered nice nice that's that's getting into stuff above my head and i love it because i always want to learn so that that's awesome so getting back to fred baron super chat there he says three characters f4f 1600 millimeter <laughs> now Maybe. i have i have to say that i love my f4f wildcat i've got it hanging there on the walls Park zone. It's the original, no AS3X, anything like that. And frankly, that airframe doesn't need any special gyro or anything like that. And for that matter, uh, my F35 there does not have a gyro in it. Um, yeah. And it doesn't need it. It flies great. In fact, I don't have gyros in any of my free wing jets, guys. So, um, And if you have them, you like them, awesome. But I haven't found that you need them, at least the jets that I have. Especially not the T33. That thing is as locked in, you know, I made sure, you know, I, I'm OCD, so I was looking and making sure everything looked good uh, visually uh, with the setup and everything. But, man, locked in right after takeoff. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah. A well-designed aircraft should never need a gyro to fly in the context of RC, obviously. Yep. It's True. different when you're talking about a real Raptor or something. Yeah. Or a Spirit. But, but. A well-designed RC model shouldn't need a gyro to fly. What the gyro should be doing, if it exists at all, is just sort of enhancing, um, magnifying the positive characteristics of the model while minimizing uh, the negative 
potential of the model if it got itself into trouble. So side slip, for example, on an airliner, um, uh, those types of things are where you really want them to help you. But they should, in my book, they should always be working behind the scenes. You shouldn't even know that it's there. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things. If I was just on a podcast the other day talking about turbines, and yeah, if, if, I, if I have an ultra banded in the sky and there's fifteen thousand dollars in the air, there's no reason not to put a demon cortex gyro in. The technology exists. It's frankly foolish not to put it in just because. But a pilot at that echelon is putting it in not because he or she needs it to be yeah. there. They're putting it in there because you know, it's scale master's day. Well, not with an ultra bandit, but it's it's show off day and there's a crosswind and they just want to make sure they nail that approach. You know, to me, that's fine. Um, it's, it's where I see gyros being used to keep aircraft aloft. That's sort of, then you're relying on the technology to fly for you. Yeah, um, and that that's a lot of like the 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 safe stuff, which is cool. Like uh, I've even got some Zod planes that are are have some of that same technology, which is is really cool, especially on the hand launch stuff. It comes in really handy with that stuff actually. But beyond well, that, like regular flying, I really don't feel like I need it. And some of the earlier um, AS three X six ish stuff, um, it fought me. It actually fought yeah. me. Because if, it, if it's not mechanically tuned perfect and in the air, you hit some clicks, you know, then it will make the gyro kind of freak out. Yeah. Yep. So, There's something for everyone. Yeah, totally. 100%, man. Um, one other RC thing. Air Marshal, is there, you know, without spilling the beans, can we expect another big flight line warbird in 2020? How many people are on this thing? 45? You guys going to get me in trouble? Probably. It's just with us friends. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's always something coming, guys. Y you should know. You should know us by now. There's um, there's always something coming. And, and I know that in watching your Instagram, there is the factories in production and things like that. And I know, but I also yeah. know that the virus uh, may have caused a little stagger in some of that. Yeah. Uh, how in China we're sort of in in the future. I mean, yeah, China's six 100%. to seven, almost eight weeks now ahead of what the states are seeing now. So it's good, and that we've sort of seen the end of that tunnel. We've seen it gets really bad for a couple of weeks. As long as everyone just does their part, stays clean, does not uh, transmit, then things get better pretty quickly. So we've been producing, you know, and have been. So don't expect any delays on that side. And oh, good. It's going to be a busy summer for us. One nice. thing you and I were talking about, Ryan, before we got live here is, you know, it's, I, I hope it's no secret by now, you know, me and, and, and our team at Motion, we're, we, we try to undersell and over deliver, you know, if you, my job is to provide you options and information. If you like something, get it. Great. If you don't, that's fine too. Yep. Um, you know, we don't need to be salesmen, which is nice, but, but that being said, um, a helpful tip to my federal modelers out there, just because we've seen it with the AL-37 and then the T-33 and then the tanks, you know, you're going to be seeing a lot of products coming out, which um, I would encourage you, if you're one of the people who looks at our videos, looks at our content, goes to Hobby Squawk, reads the novels that I'm writing that talks about these things, if you're one of those people who decides you want to try it, I would encourage you to try it um, rather than waiting. Yeah. Because uh, it's just again, it's the math. Um, people, there are, we are, we got a lot of people contacting us the past couple of days saying, "I I was waiting on a tank. When are you getting more?" And it sort of it breaks my heart because I need yeah. to say, "Look, I've been we've had tanks on the website since December. It's been three months, yeah. and we got them in stock. They've been in stock for one month. Um, you know, we thought we ordered half a year's worth." They're gone in a month. I can't predict all of that. We're doing as much as we can to make them available for as long as we can. But at the end of the day, if if, if everyone else sort of beats you to the punch, I, I, I can't I can't help you. Um, and unfortunately, with uh, Chinese New Year and what coronavirus is going to do is a lot of, if there is any influence it's going to have on us, and I, I, I'd imagine many other hobby companies, the effect it may have is that um, restocks are going to become yeah. ever so slightly, you know, 
they may become delayed. It might not be the next containers coming in two weeks like normal. It might be a longer interval. So if you're looking for stuff, try and get it. If, if you're one of the guys who missed out on the tanks, you know, Mark posted in Hobby Squawk today, we've got more coming. They're about two months away, and you know, hopefully <laughs> hopefully by the time they're they're back in stock, you're still going to want one. So I'm, I'm sure we will. Uh, I know I'm going to. Exactly, Wild Bill. That's why we brought in balsa. <laughs> so there's always, yeah, there's that's true. Balsa. So yeah, and, and that stuff's made in Vietnam for the most part, right? Yes. Yeah, all of our balsa is made in Vietnam. Better access to better balsa there, and Vietnam's been doing it for a long time. Most balsa aircraft you've seen uh, in in our f- form from any manufacturer, they're they're likely built in Vietnam. There, there are a couple in China, but really the lion's share of anyone other than the absolute uh, high end are typically sourcing their their wood or some of their production from down there. Um, so question on, on the factories like in Vietnam and potentially Taiwan, Indonesia, uh, given what's going on with that and also the distance in the ocean, have you got, and, and you don't have to answer this at all, but have, have you guys thought about uh, doing anything with factories uh, in other locations other than the, the core there, kind of like you did with the balsa? Yeah, it depends because you can't just, um, contrary to sort of popular misinformed belief, it, it, it takes a whole lot more than renting space in another region. Okay. Um, these factories are tied to freewing, I've said in publicly in the past, with over 50 suppliers to wow. build that agent. So, you know, there's the laser cutting guy and the carbon fiber guy and the wheel guy. And and um, one of the ways you control costs is you can't necessarily go completely vertically integrated and bring everything in house. The MOQs sure. aren't there. So you have to rely on this 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 ecosystem that's sort of provincial at this point to put this aircraft together. It's that the same sense. reason why, I mean, think about it. Your airplanes are built a few miles from where all the Apple iPhones are built and where Huawei phones, all of these sort of uh, places, just Google Shenzhen, and you'll find that 80% of the world's electronics come from where we live. And there's a reason why those factories are there. It's because if they need parts, if they need subcomponents, uh, it's a phone call away. Moving a factory to some other area will move the factory. But now, where's the supply chain? Um, And not only the supply chain, but where are the workers? In the context of Balsa, these people, these are handcrafted. Most of Black Horse's workers have been there for 10 years or more. So they, you know, you can't just teach someone how to cover a Balsa aircraft, at least not to the level that they do. Yeah, so I would not be able to of, do um, that job well. I know that much. Yeah, a lot of hurdles. I mean, is it a dream to sort of be able to bring certain elements of, of the production process to other places like Europe or North America? Absolutely. Um, it just needs to happen in a way that, one makes financial sense but really two most of all makes practical sense yeah you've got to and and we don't want our models to to triple or quadruple in price either especially not overnight that that not wouldn't be fun absolutely right shadow and there's regulatory hurdles with the epa and other types of things name names but uh josh i think you bring up a good point 3d metal printing here in the states there are emerging technologies. Well, 3D printing has been around for 20 years, but there are emerging sort of technologies that are becoming increasingly uh, low cost and easy to operate, such as 3D printing at a production scale that sort of open up the open up the territory more for people like Kelly. I mean, Kelly is a great example. The machine that she uses to make all of our decals for all of us who've used her services in the past used to be a very expensive machine that someone couldn't have access to. But now someone in rural New Mexico can have a device and have a business and be able to sort of take part in our in our currency. So I think that's where the opportunity is for hobbyists all around. Gudiak, the RC Geek, and people like this. Um, we've got 3D designers like Dirty D and LB and other people who are able to sort of use skill sets, find a way where that fits into the hobby, and find a way to sort of make it all make financial sense. So where we see that, I applaud it 110%, whether we're involved in it or not. I think I think um, we have too much technology, guys, at our fingertips to to say that things aren't possible. Everything's possible. 
That's and that's the thing. We're we're gonna we're using technology right now. I mean, Alpha's in China right now, um, on the West Coast, and you guys are sprinkled all over the place. So, uh, the tech these days is awesome, and we're gonna rely on it very heavily here while we're hunkered down. I have a feeling I'm probably gonna do more impromptu uh, streams if I get locked down anyway. More impromptu streams than I planned. So we'll we'll see how that goes. Thanks, Fred. Appreciate that, man. Yeah, Fred. Yeah, Alpha is Alpha is definitely an easy interview. <laughs> Just plant yeah. a little seed and a cheap date. Yeah, man, I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm would never claim to be Johnny Carson or anything. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah or, George. We may. Um, I was talking to James the other day. We're likely going to do another factory walkthrough video. People really like the free wing factory walkthrough video. Fun. We're probably going to do. Um, it's no secret by now. We'll likely do one with Black Horse. We've got the footage already. Um, we'll probably do one with Robon helicopters. Maybe once a month or so, we'll take we'll take uh, the audience into one of our factories. Uh, we've got a bunch now, so being able to see see the tank factory, you know, die cast metal parts is pretty neat to see. Um, Robon helicopters and rotor scale helicopters with fiberglass molds also. You know, an entirely different world, balsa with laser cut and how they assemble these things. So as long as people want to see that type of content, we will um, we'll keep it rolling. Night, Mike. Night, Mike. Yeah, so uh, Mickey B has a question. Alpha, is Dorit still at Freewing? Well, yeah, she's the boss's wife, so she's still there. <laughs> oh, nice. So is that what that F... F W ninety was named after was named after Dora. No, the um, it's just a happy convenience. The F W one ninety D nine that was the last oh, iteration okay. of they, they went to A two A four A six and then yep. it went into D's. So the the D dot nine uh, was its variant and gotcha. you know, pilots actually not necessarily during the war but shortly thereafter began to refer to it as the Dora. Okay. So yeah, because I nice. had a, an A six that I got uh, as a park zone one, cool plane. Uh, I was mostly landing on grass at the time, and um, it made things more complicated. I was I was too much of a weenie to try and land with a, a plane that size on asphalt. It's kind of laughable now, <laughs> looking back <laughs> at, at at how things have advanced with with my uh, confidence in RC stuff. But yeah, um, fun plane though. And you know, I may have to talk John. So guys, back there is the the partner to the Dora. The P-51 that, uh, if you guys watch most of my videos, Reckonroy's RC, he had a yellow one. We got some cool footage of him flying his not that long ago. And uh, maybe I can talk John into getting the Dora so we can have some fun flying in the sky. Yeah. Yeah, good fun, bird. And 3 and 4S power, guys. So which... How... How fast do you think that one? I know some of those questions you may not have clocked or anything like that, but but how fast uh, do you think each one of those goes on 4S? The 3S is a, the 3S power systems for both are right around the 60 mile an hour through the 60 65. Okay. Uh, we've seen people get faster if they're using higher C packs and they're diving it. Airspeed, mm -hmm. not airspeed, but um, your ASL is obviously going to vary uh, and have an impact on a small prop like that um the four s's will put you pretty close to 100 i mean they they get um nice. we actually had to prop down because we we had intended for that series to go more towards beginners um okay. the havoc was that's that's your mustang racer yeah. um, that's your 120 bird so the 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 p51 the scale p51 is really intended more for someone who wanted to have a 3s bird that they didn't have to worry about flying all fast all the time um but airframe wise the airframe will take higher speeds we just in production decided to keep it just under that that magic sort of three three digit mark to make it more appealing not everyone always wants to go too fast so so yeah, how the havoc how fast havoc, will the havoc go i think you so said the havoc 20 yeah, she's easy above a hundred and can be dived to 120 i mean okay. an honest pass no 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 um no diving or whatnot, you're going to catch a hundred average back to back. That was sort of the mission spec for that okay. aircraft. Got it. But probably more importantly, with the Havoc, was I didn't, if we wanted it to be 125, we could have, but 
it would have required certain things, certain other sacrifices. So, for example, it would have been a, a beast to hand launch. Like most uh, warm liners yeah. and hot liners are, yeah. you know, there are a lot of great uh, planes out there that are that specialize in speed. The EFX racer is probably one of my favorite uh, foam racers because it is a fast, slippery bird. Um, and that's what it's designed for, and that's what it does really, really well. With the Havoc, we didn't want to do a bird that was that fast. We probably couldn't have met it. So we, we went that balanced route again, my favorite word, balance. Yeah, balance is where good, it was to us it was fast enough it was plus 100 and at the same time it lands much slower and is much more an overall sort of sport aircraft a sport airframe that's most of all easy to hand launch it's no fun if it takes a dirt nap after 10 seconds or completely five. and and then you need an advanced gyro that makes it easier to, to hand launch with like a safe s type yeah. system and things like that um and it looked like uh, the, just the, the nice underhand toss looks super easy by Wes, and I think Wes is still in here. I saw him earlier. Um, haven't been keeping up with the chat that well, actually. Um, sorry, guys, about that. But the thing that I noticed really the most about this thing is just the thickness of the pieces. Like, even out here, it's thick, and all the carbon fiber in here. So, if you guys, I would think that guys could upgrade this or like upgrade the power system and just push it to the limits because yeah. it's built we knew that people would i mean there's all that difference when you're when you're developing a pnp aircraft you want to hit the widest part of the market yep. if someone said it's not fast enough or i hate the color scheme that's okay because for the havoc i wanted people to say well at least it's easy to hand launch once you have that mission accomplished you build the aircraft and the airframe to be able to sustain other people's fantasies. So uh, okay. there's yeah, enough sure. in there where we knew someone's going to go 4S over square prop or someone's going to go 6S high wind, some sort of other type of setup, which is fine. The aircraft will take it. Um, but there's always that difference between what we deliver for the masses and having a little bit in there for the customizers out there. Definitely. So. Definitely. If someone's asked me, I want a, I want a foam aircraft, hundred or so dollars. That just all I want is speed. I'd say go get an EFX, yeah. great airplane. Um, you know, I didn't design it; it's not ours, but doesn't matter. It's a good flying airplane. I'd recommend that one. Yeah, the, the V nine hundred. a balanced flight, I'd say go this one. Yeah, the V nine hundred. It's it's you know, cool, but it's it's. Hey Joel, what's going on, man? You get a wrench. Uh, the V nine hundred is just so fragile. Like, while Bill Flynn, my buddy, he. He has the V900, but everything about it in comparison is just wimpy. The battery bay is tiny. Um, the 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 root by the the tail feathers in the back of the fuse is just petite. Yeah, yeah. We also sort of developed that airplane to be able to fit um, FPV cameras. So yeah, if you look at that canopy, the reason why it's clear molded quick. versus a lot of other models is specifically so people can jam their <laughs> FPV camera in there. So yeah. something for everyone. There's enough aircraft out there we can choose. Alright. Yeah, my pleasure, George. Sorry guys, I disconnected from Lysander's a Lysander's a big bird, but even though it has those really large wheel pants, uh Ryan, we're talking about the uh, we're talking about the Lysander George Ass from Black Horse. Okay. Even though it's that big of a bird, doesn't look very slick like this Havoc. It flies like a P fifty one Mustang. I don't know what they did to it. Yeah, there you go. So in the Havoc, you see that clear canopy for FPV cameras. And here's here's just a little guy right there. I mean, we can't keep seem to keep them in stock, so I suppose that's a good thing. Yeah, man. Good problem to have. <laughs> I sort of felt bad by the time you got yours, uh, GB. We we ran out. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's all right, man. Get more later. <laughs> long 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 term demand's not a bad thing. You can ratchet up the yeah. production at the factory, right? We'll point to the video later and say, that. <laughs> "Go back and watch that." <laughs> yeah, totally, man. Totally. In fact, I'm gonna go grab Thanks the you. the Shrike because him and I, uh, Alpha and I, were talking off camera before we had great conversation leading up to this i kind of wish that you guys were able to hear part of that 
Uh, but we're talking about the Shrike and, and the bird that it was actually based on. It's, it's based on a, a bird that impales um, things. It's awesome. I'm going to go grab the pieces. And mm-hmm. it's a, that's another beautiful plane. I remember when uh, James and Wesley were unveiling both of these planes, actually, at Nall in the Fall. And you were like, yeah, you probably probably won't like those in the chat. And I just loved how they looked, man. Um, what's what's the gentleman's name that lives in Washington um, that designed those? Uh, Arrows, I think. Uh, he's on Hobbit. Oh, Arrows. Yeah, Todd. Yeah, Todd. Todd's Todd. our graphic guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's really I was, good. I was telling him just in, in messaging the other day, I'm like, man, those things, you did a great job because they're beautiful. Yeah, I took, I told him, I said, Shrike, it's a bird. It's called the Butcher, you know, for all of these reasons. And he ran with it and looks, uh, I, I think it looks pretty sharp. A lot of people seem to like it. Definitely. And I'll go grab that right now. While he's away, everyone, what is that thing on Ryan's wall? What is that? Let's all take a vote. Is that a is that a frisbee goal? Is that a stargate? What what is this? What is this thing on his wall? That big circular thing. Oh, it is an FPV gate. Okay, it looks so fl- it looks like a sticker. It's so flat up against the wall. <laughs> Gosh, what is that thing? I'm going to call it a Stargate. Stargate's cooler than Drone Gate. That should be fine. All right. Rilo, you can. It's just hey, probably Rilo, won't fly you know, for very it, long. <laughs> tonight, I probably can't fly a UMX in my room tonight, Rilo. <laughs> Couple streams, I, I did that, though. It was, it was kind of crazy. I was like, okay, I, I hadn't seen anyone that did streams do any f- actual flying on camera live. I'm like, okay, what the heck? So, so this, guys, is the Shrike. This thing keeps getting unplugged. Yeah, with or without drinks, George Watts. So battery bay nice and big and I've got this unbox ready both with both these planes um, I knew I wasn't gonna get out to fly him because uh, John VHRC's had other stuff that he's had to do on the weekends uh, but I just love the graphics on this thing and I know my camera is kind of wigging out a little bit but the color that green with this purple it just looks awesome so when uh, Wesley James, or Wesley and James were doing that at, at Nall in the Fall, it's like, man, those things look awesome. And I love what I love liners. about the Shrike, the the actual the real life bird, a bit behind the scenes and the inspiration behind why we called it the Shrike. The Shrike is a, it's a small bird. It's about nine or ten inches. Yeah, uh, just a little large. Bit. But but it's a it's a it's a carnivorous predator. So they're they're called butcher birds. They look like these cute little birds you would see. So we have the image of the Shrike glider sort of being this, sort of looks like an albatross or or a vulture. It's up there cruising like a glider would, but at the same time, because it does have flaps and full ailerons and has sort of that sport glider uh, feel, it can also dive down and, and, and get it, so to speak. So the Shrike seemed like an adequate name, an apropos name, because uh, it's a predator. I love predators. And predators are awesome. Uh, they're actually got, baby raptors. So uh, at the go. time we were developing this bird, it was the same time we were developing foil, the F-22 raptor. Okay. So I was deep into sort of the, the mythos and etymology behind those two aircraft. So anyway. And my favorite part about this, because I'm going to have to pop the wings off to be able to transport it. There's also a carbon spar too, guys. Um, that I've got in the other room, but quick connects, plugs, and these things just pop right in here, man. Yeah. Damn. 
Yeah, again, intended for, for beginners who don't want to be fussing with wires. Um, it seemed like the right decision just to clean up that joint so you can put it back in the box. So. Or lazy people like me that, that uh, prefer that. And then of course, or lazy it's, people like you. Yeah. yeah. And then it's got a, a plastic piece that I have in the other room that just slides in there and holds these things in nice and secure. So really well done, dude. I, I really like it. And I cannot wait to fly it. One of the things that we were talking about earlier too, um, not just the, the Shrike itself, was the performance, what this thing can do. Like, uh, like what James said when I was doing the unboxing, I, I definitely want to get your take on, on the performance and what you've been able to do with yours. It's got lights yeah, too, so by the way, guys. Nice big bulbous lights. Yeah, so it's a bit of um, the Shrike is a, is it's a mixed bird. It's it's it has the ability to be flown and set up. I should say it can be set up to be flown like a docile trainer. When we looked at this aircraft. It's everyone's got a glider we added one because we don't have one so it made sense to, to do a glider so it is a powered motor glider and can be flown and set up like a conventional one um and 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 live its life at at a quarter throttle and be absolutely happy like that at the same time we wanted it to have a little bit of grit and so the uh, the spec on the ailerons and the control surfaces are sort of geared towards if you wanted to set it up like such, it could be flown more like a sport acrobatic glider. So I know that James set his up where it doesn't really knife edge. Mine is set up to knife edge um, and to have a much so higher So that will knife mold. edge? So, yeah, oh, it'll absolutely knife edge. Um, there's a lot of coupling in it. It's just, you know, it's just how the aircraft is going to be set up. So what we're telling people is think of it as a, as a trainer glider set it up that way that's how the manual is prescribed to have it set up but okay if and when you're ready to sort of wake it up a bit um increase your throws increase your control uh, sensitivity move the battery back just a smidge and you've got something that's going to roll uh, very <laughs> very sprightly and uh, be able to fly inverted and do all those sort of wacky things that i like to do um People have probably seen me fly that AL-37 inverted with gear passes. So that's... I remember that. People were so... <laughs> Man, the, the, the reaction in the comments was ridiculous. Like, it was entertaining <laughs> because it was so ridiculous, but at the same time, I was like, come on, guys, what are you doing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you've got you to yeah. push the envelope to, to know what those thresholds are, right? And that's kind of what you were doing in that, that scenario, yeah, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you have to. Um, and you're right, uh, RF Heinz, you, know, you, you need all the way max rudder travel uh, and with the, with the Shrike when it's on its side to keep a, a good consistent knife edge, you need airspeed. So that's one of those. It's, it's 100%. I enter into a dive and I can keep it in a pretty tight corkscrew on its side. Um, and of course, I don't have the prop on. And I'm not sure if you saw the live stream or not, Alpha, but... For, for part, it was actually hilarious. I watched it back uh, before I did the Havoc live stream because I'm like, okay, what can I do better uh, than I did there or not? And not only did I not change the camera and I was bouncing back and forth a couple times and then finally noticed it when I came back out here, um, I had the prop on backwards for a while and I wasn't paying attention to the, the chat. And I was rolling on the floor laughing on the replay watching it back pretty funny <laughs> and james was dying the comments he was making that's part of why i was laughing because he was you know giving me some bro crap pretty yeah. funny a little bit of safe calamity that's always a good thing. oh heck Never yeah hurt anyone that's <laughs> that's what it's all about yep yep so so the f-35 what did you uh what did you need to do to it to get guniac set up in there so let me grab it and, and pull it closer and So the first thing I had to do was, was pop this off down here and get access. 
to the EDF unit, which it's set in there all nice. And, and then I had to glue the unit on the back and, and uh, secured it with a zip tie. Sounds more complicated than it is. It's actually pretty straightforward. When I first heard that, I thought, oh no, that's out of my comfort zone because I'm not crafty at all. That's not what I do. But uh, it was, wasn't bad at all. It wasn't bad at all. And, and then I've got some board stuff here in the front. I pop out the battery, it'll be easier to see it. Add about 4,000. Alright. So I just used the, the Go Get Them wire, which thank you for including that uh, in all the kits. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Man, I've used that in other planes too, and it's it's always handy. So I just uh, snaked it through, and then I've got it running. Here, let's see. In there, and we've got a board here at the end. It's got a switch on it, and you can switch it off or on, uh, whether you want it or not. And then we've got a clip that goes into the battery, and that's pretty much it. It's really it's. It is easy and, and it's straightforward. So, um, I think it's pretty cool, man. Yeah. The, the tech that's out there, like when I started flying my Hobby Zone Champ back in the day, my ultimate goal was to fly something like this. I'd never dreamed of having a, a fire booty and something like that. And the detail on this plane is ridiculous. I know that you covered that in the factory video and all that, but... Uh, the detail's just phenomenal, guys. I can't say enough about this plane. The F-22 John VHRC, absolutely. Shout out to John. He absolutely loves his. He's not sure which one he likes better between the T-33 and the F-22. He likes them both. He he flew them both back to back, and I was like, man, I'm not sure. These are both so good. I don't know. So, hmm. and the air was pretty pretty uh, favorable that day. So. Uh, there weren't any outside interferences. He he really liked them both. Yeah, that's a hard choice. I mean, we we developed the the Raptor and the T thirty three to be completely different flight envelopes. Um, the only similarity, really, to me, is that they both land very easily. Yeah. But um, yeah, the T thirty the the Raptor is going to just depart at a certain angle. It's just very different from the T thirty three. They stall slightly differently, but okay. But um, both in their own rights, I think, are good flying birds. Definitely. So one of the notes that I made uh, just before we went on. Uh, so my question to you is is the, the plastic that you've added to the wingtips on some of these planes. I think my <laughs> yeah. A4 has that too. When did yeah, you A4's add that? When did you add that? What, what planes uh, did we, you start adding that? We rolled that in uh, after the F-15. Okay. Just sort of slowly, quietly, you know, our, our job is to listen to what people say and yeah. implement where we can. Uh, we try and pre-predict and preempt what people would want in an aircraft. And oh. certainly by the time we release something, we want to say, this is, this is how I fly it. This is what I think you'll like. Um, for the most part, we tend to be right on and aligned with what people want. And then where we're, where we're wrong or whether we miss something or someone says, well, I'd actually like a bit of this or a bit of that. You know, it's our jobs to respond. So, um, people said we'd like plastic covers over the servos so that we can unscrew them. You know, we don't mind the added weight or the added cost or, or what have you. So we did it. Things like the the F-15 having a bit of wingtip rash. It made sense with the F-35 uh, to put plastic in there. Small things here and there. Um, even yeah, the F-5, for that matter, had plastic in certain areas. So the, I think not all of them are sort of those too, wild. Right? Uh, yeah, the A4 had them as well. So not everything is this wild feature that we're going to talk about saying, look at what we did. Sometimes it's just we just try and bake it in on whatever's next. Yeah. Um, so that we're always innovating, not necessarily iterating. And, uh, yeah, from time to time people will notice it. The boxing even is something that, that I'm proud of, be able to cram these aircraft into ever smaller boxes, with the yeah. airliner being probably the best example. 
I bet my left thumb, no one thought there was a two meter long <laughs> airliner in that box when it showed up. Um, but those are sort of things that may not seem like very sexy, marketable aspects of what we do, but they're important because we're the ones paying the shipping. <laughs> so, so, Big time. You know. Well, and, 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 and then the more of those you can pack into a storage thing, it, you'll save on shipping and be able to pass that on to the customer for a better value. Absolutely. You know, the airliner, what it is, and then the, the F-35 you got in front of you for the in-runner plus putting in suspension. Suspension oh, yeah. used to be an aftermarket upgrade for the F-16s, uh, 70s, and the Hawk. You have to pay another 20 30 40 bucks or whatever it was. If you yeah. want the in-runner, you got to bake in another $100. So, yeah. again, we ask people on Hobby Squawk, do you want us to move in towards the in-runner space? I We've had in-runners for six years. You know, we've yeah. always had them available as sort of high-performance versions, but no one ever seemed to buy them. So oh, okay. we didn't quite understand. We've had in-runners for years and years. Why aren't people – people are saying that they want them, but we have them, but they're not buying them. Huh. So we asked the question, and it, that question actually wasn't ever truly answered. All we know is people said, yes, we would like to see them in all of the models. And maybe it was that people were wary that – the inner runner was only available in one or two models, and they were waiting okay. until they saw it more widely available that they jumped in. So the F-35 was that first model where we made the decision, we're not going to have a, a 4S version and a 6S version and a 6S inner runner version. We're just going to have one, and it's yeah. going to have all the bells and whistles baked into it, and we're going to sit back and see if people really meant what they said when they said we'd rather buy it pre-upgraded. And they did. So... Um, but it's anyway, going sexy. back to like boxes, being able to make all of like the RAM paneling we did in our free wing, our uh, th that free wing factory walkthrough episode I keep referencing, which we did about a month ago on Motion mm -hmm. RC's channel, shows that aircraft being painted with the RAM paneling, copper mold uh, paint masks, all the decals. So all of that we sort of put into the aircraft, recognizing that it was going to be on the spendier side with an inrunner power system. We didn't want to just do base gray, you know. Yeah, well, it wanted to pretty it up a bit. Well, and it's <laughs> it's only two eighty two, which is is the the same yeah. price as the the seventy millimeter well, freewing hawk high performance. Yeah. If you had bought everything separately, it would have been uh, three hundred and ten or three hundred and twenty is what we had figured out. So, you know, it's it's typically always cheaper to get the meal instead of a la carte. And you know, totally. we're just this time we're happy the fact that we were able to say you guys wanted us to do it. You're our bosses, so we did it, and people seem to like it, so I'm happy. Man, I'm happy with this purchase. The, I, I'll be honest, the first flight, and this is the other question that I have too. So the, the first flight, I had the dual rates for the aileron set at 50%, and the, the CG was a touch back um, further than I, I it felt right for me, and then uh, if needed trim and the the ailerons were a little bit twitchier so the sweet spot for me is 40 percent on the ailerons on this thing and with the cg just a touch farther forward and a little more trim ever since then like the second flight on i've i've loved this thing mm. so my yeah. question is how are your what's different between your servos and then like the e flight ones like because on the su30 i have to have a hundred percent rates on the ailerons just to do a somewhat labored aileron roll and this one will do drill bits at 40 percent yeah that's gonna that's gonna vary on, on a lot of different factors uh it's gonna vary on um on your mechanical leakage, sort of how they're set up, what hole you're using, you know, for lack of a technical term. Yeah. Um, so your armature itself, you know, how much control authority you have, the relative size of the surface, of the control surface to the aircraft is also obviously going to differ. For astute observers, you'll notice most of our aircraft do not have scale sort of sized uh, flight control surfaces. A lot of times we need to make the ailerons a little bigger or we need mm. to make them a little deeper. Um, okay. it, a lot of sort of those things. So you look at a given aircraft, the, the, the Sukhoi and the F-35 are apples and oranges, but sort of in any given aircraft, I'll say, you, you set a mission as for roll rate, stability, and, and stability on its side, stall, etc. And you try and design the aircraft's flight control surfaces around the context of that model. 
because that might change. You know, a 64 millimeter F35 versus a 90 millimeter F35, it, that math may change. In, in fact, it almost always does. So it comes down to that, whether it has full span ailerons or whether it has uh, outboard onlys or, or whatnot. You could certainly develop, you could certainly design or set up a Sukhoi to have a roll rate almost as axial or as quick as, say, an F35 or an mm -hmm. F16, but it's going to cost you in other areas. Okay. You're probably going to have much larger surfaces, um, for example. Um, it's, it's servos may need to, you know, you, you're just going to have different setups to achieve that mission. Got it. Got it. Yeah, because I, I always I'm, I was thinking that after we got off the phone this afternoon, I'm like, man, I want to ask him that question because I've always had <laughs> that question because every single free wing aircraft I've had um, compared to the Horizon Hobby stuff and and Hobby King stuff's kind of in the middle. Um, it's just so much little, it's more responsive, it's m more twitchy, it's uh, got more throws generally. And I'm always doing it on the, the recommended book stuff. Because I'm, I'm yeah. usually reviewing stuff out of the box. So that's what I'm doing. I'm not adding my fancy spin to it until a little bit later on and we're doing hobby time. And then I'll adjust it to more my taste. Yeah. Like like we always say, in, in life, as it is with developing aircraft, everything is a Venn diagram. You have overlapping circles uh, of, of interests and of goals between price, weight, performance, top speed, stall speed, wing loading, um, producibility, complexity, will it fit in a box? <laughs> yeah. All of these different sorts of things. So you're always, you're always, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't characterize it as fighting, but you're always cognizant of that balance and oh, yeah you and make i make those think, choices every day right absolutely you know what you're giving up to get to gain a certain thing gotcha so guniak in the chat said to date his free wing 90 millimeter f15 has been the best so guniak what do you like the most about it man Yeah, he probably does have 500 flights on that eagle. I believe it, man. He, a lot of videos of that bird. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's He flies the crap out of his planes, too. Did you see him fly this, his F-35 at night in the dark? I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> You're a savage, Ray. You're an absolute savage. <laughs> yeah, Ray. <laughs> savage. Absolutely, Josh. You know, there's no free lunch. Yeah. That's um. That's the magic. That's where the magic is. That's the secret sauce. That's the fun, and that's also where where most of us go to die. You know, it's you ride that line in that Venn diagram to um to make things stick. You know, it's probably why we're never gonna have a B fifty eight hustler. Mm. Um, like I I can't make it less than a thousand dollars. It's gonna it's gonna be a quad eighty millimeter. It's gonna fit in two boxes. It's just the market for something that large and that complex, um, just it's just not there. Yeah. So, and, and for the guys that don't know or haven't heard, uh, the investment in the 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 molds alone is is pretty crazy, isn't it? Like pretty expensive. Yeah, you're six figures. I mean, and if you're wrong, you know, guess what? You know, <laughs> you're toast. That's not good. So. <clears throat> So yeah, it's uh, we don't talk numbers too much for obvious competitive reasons, but it's it's no big secret. And the article that I linked to, and and I'll drop it in again, just in the string in case anyone's curious. Yeah, I do. But um, you know, I wrote this article just to give people, just just it's a shade of a hint on the tip of the iceberg of what's involved. And I'm sure many of us can talk about our careers and talk for hours about what it is that we do. And yeah. and so, you know, in this case, in my context. All I can say is there's a lot going on, and if you make the wrong decision, you know you're toast. So when people say, "I want this airplane, I want that airplane," easy math is ask yourself: Are there 999 other people asking for the same thing? Because if there aren't, you know, you're asking you're asking a lot of us. You're asking us to make a a, a leap of faith, as it were. And thus far, you know, it's not doom and gloom because thus far we've sort of taken feedback. And then run that through the filter of what you're going to see in that article. You know how much is going to cost, size, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so far, have been able to sort of say, we think the Raptor at 90 millimeter at this price is going to 
please the majority of you. And we think a T33 at 80 millimeter versus a 90 or a 70, you know, that's going to that's gonna hit you, the, the widest group of people, to be able to pay off, you know, a quarter million dollar investment. Um, yeah, that's, that's significant. You know, yeah, you look at, you count up all the people in all the forums in the world, 40 people here. All of you wanted a, a B-58 Hustler uh, and were prepared to pledge $1,000. I'd say, excellent. Now each of you go find nine or ten other people, and then I'll break even. <laughs> you know, it's just so that, that, math, that, you guys. Yeah, speaking of the math, and, and you don't have to answer this at all because it, it may or may not be insider stuff. But like the batch size, what what generally? I know different plane, different math, all that stuff. But generally, what kind of runs are we talking for a, a plane like this? Are are you when you do yeah, a production a I'm, full production run? I'm not. I can't say numbers, but yeah. I but I can say that. Um, I mean, guys, just look at that article look at the machines that we need you know consider that over a hundred people touched that aircraft that that f-35 took us 20 months to develop yeah. um and and during those 20 months we produced the f-22 and the f-4 and the corsair and the l-39 right <laughs> like the avanti at the time was was the one we had just sort of released so when you talk about making five to ten aircraft in a given year um, rough numbers. You, you, you have to sell thousands, thousands, and brass tacks, guys. There aren't a thousand of us on podcasts. There aren't a thousand. True. There aren't ten thousand people on a forum talking about the AL three seven. Yeah. So now that doesn't mean that we're not hitting numbers. If we weren't, we wouldn't exist. Um, what it means, and I think the call to action here that's important for people who are love this hobby as much to be sitting here listening to us yap about it for an hour yeah is that the call to action is there are more of you there are more like-minded people like you out there they're just not visible yeah. they never come to hobby squawk they never go to rc groups they never come onto a podcast they're not on facebook now on the one hand that's fine people should be free to enjoy their hobby alone if they want to you know i'm not going to dictate that but at the same time we each have that opportunity to become missionaries as it were and say guys you know I know I'm not the only one who wants a hustler, but Alpha said, you know, you got to go blow him up on Hobby Squawk and say we want one. Um, that's sort of that first step, you know. At the very least, we sort of are sitting back, wanting, hoping that we see some sort of pattern that makes our math a little easier to swallow. Because let's say, let's say I didn't speak English and and never looked at any bit of feedback from anyone online, I would make the things that I would want. Yeah. You know, which may not necessarily be the things that all of you want. So the call to action here, guys, is you have to let us know, and you need to get everyone else you know to let us know. That is how you can influence this ship. That's how you can steer um, us. Yeah, <laughs> and I and think that's a rare opportunity, right? I mean, how many people are going to tell you that? But yeah, but and we mean well, it. The, 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 and for you guys, Hobby Squawk is where it's at. That's, that's where um, all the top people... That, that run Motion RC, they're watching that. So if you guys are commenting about specific planes like Fred Barron, uh, the F4F Wildcat that you're talking about, post about it there. Yeah. We've had people blow us up for uh, for a Corsair, and then we made the Corsair. People wanted a Concorde, and I had to say, you all yeah. need to learn how to fly a bit better before I do one of those. <laughs> We've had people looking for an OV-10 for an FB-111. I mean, everyone yeah. has, we all have our unicorn list, right? That OV-110 um, is, is flipping awesome, too. I was really lucky. My buddy, uh, Robert, he's actually a, a pilot. I think he works for the Army. Um, goes out to a local, uh, our, our local uh, uh, Warbird event every summer. And I always get killer video of him flying stuff. I've got him flying all sorts of good stuff, uh, which I got three awesome flights for for the OV-10 right around the time that it was released. So that was fun to do, yeah. put out there yeah. for some people to see. Of course, it was sold out right away, even before I, I was posting those videos, but it was cool for people to see it in action. Yeah, yeah. Uh, George Watch had a good question here. You know, how long does it take a production line to switch from one model production to the next? Yeah, well, that's question. the thing, guys. 
in the context of say free wing at free wing we produce free wing jets and flight line warbirds you know we've got 40 plus aircraft so so it is not a linear production line you can't just make one at any given week we're shipping more product to ourselves and so at any given week you're producing 20 different airplanes so the long answer is um we 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 don't switch we we have a completely integrated line where each team, and, and again, we cover some of this in that Motion RC uh, episode. I'm going to try and pull it up here, but but suffice to say, each team specializes in a given stage of production. So you'll have the decal team, for example. All they do is decals. So they frankly don't Not care right. if they're getting an F-35 or they're getting an AL-37. They just, whatever comes to their station they're in, they're putting decals on it. So that allows you to sort of keep every team focused on one specific uh, process. You don't need to say one person isn't going to uh, carry a model throughout the entire production process, which then would make it difficult to sort of switch things up, if that makes sense. So that, there, there are a lot of ways to sort of get around this, and, and mass producing multiple production uh, products at the same time is sort of, that's again one of those things you need to get good at if you're going to survive. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, we have more we have more products than Ferrari and Apple combined and Samsung. They all have like five or six. I'm not talking about Ferrari hats. I mean, you know, cars. Yeah. Um, when you think of most companies, most most companies that produce a consumer good don't have forty or fifty of that given thing. Um, the hobby world is, is interesting in that there are a lot of companies like Skymaster, uh, great turbine uh, jet manufacturer. There's a reason why they don't have a hundred different models. They they make a few a year, so they have they have smaller production. They have a smaller portfolio that helps them produce the quantities that they need to stay open. So, my point in all this is everything is a balance. How you produce something, how many, how many you can produce at a given time, um, and all that. It, I think it's obvious as well. We don't produce these things linearly, right? We don't. You don't only make T-33s once. We made. We've been producing them almost nonstop since we announced the aircraft. Um, and that's you just good. add them. You add them into the fold, <laughs> which is why we're going to need to cancel some from time to time. But um, so far, we haven't really done that. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the other things that I like too about. Uh, the free wing stuff it seems the the lifespan of the aircraft is longer than than a lot of the other folks which is good because you've got longer parts availability and some of those other things that for me I don't generally crash or, or ding up a wing tip or anything like that very often with most yep. of my planes but with the jets they're a little slipperier um, you're gonna run into a little bit more of that as it, your skills get challenged so it's nice that when I buy this, I bought this pre-order. I was so stoked to get it because I'd wanted an F-35 for quite a while. Uh, for my first pre-order, actually, from from Motion, and I know this thing's going to be around for a long time because it's, it's yeah. a killer plane, and it is one of the the few planes that are in stock right now on Motion RC. So <laughs> if you're thinking about getting one, guys, I don't know how long, much longer it's going to be around available. Uh, before the stock goes out like the tanks the tanks are completely out in fact let's let, we, we didn't uh, practice this um, off screen so let's see if this works I'm not sure if the Skype and uh, the web browser are gonna fight each other because they're kind of set up on the same thing here on my OBS but let's let's give it a try here Nope. Maybe if I try it. There we go. Yep, out of stock, guys. Pretty soon the planes are, might just look like <laughs> that. So, man, all the tanks are gone. Woo. Yep. It's uh it's intense. Um Mikey B is asking about the uh 
the Eurofighter 2000. Yeah, that aircraft is, that mold was set up for EPS foam, not EPO. So in a word, um, to answer your question, you know, is it quite a large task to overcome? Yes. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot. I don't think we're going to do it, but I haven't decided just yet. So the the EF two thousand. I'm not good fam- bird though. One of my favorites. Just, I'm not familiar um, with that one. That's it's a Eurofighter. Okay. It's a Eurofighter. It's the Canarda Delta. Okay. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Neat bird. It's called the Typhoon. Oh, the Typhoon. Okay, I, I know what that is. That is cool. And and in fact, at the Abbotsford Air Show, they had one that was on display where you could get in it, but it was pouring down rain, so they closed it up. And then by the time that I was going to go back there and it, the, it stopped raining the line was so long i <clears throat> couldn't sit in it and i wanted to sit in it yeah maybe next year yeah if, if i did a canard delta i wasn't on the eurofighter project i was only on the v2 where we sort of updated the landing gear and gave it removable wings and things but if i was on the ground level as i would be now on a new canard delta it, it it would be it would be it would be it would have to be better is, is eurofighter that- was an excellent bird for its time um, it was built in EPS and it was actually really, really good aircraft for its time and sold really well. The, the thing is, is you need, it, it's 11 years old, so you would need something new, something, um, a different approach at it. And you would have to, because with EPO, so to answer sort of Josh's question asking about the differences between, um, between different types of foams. EPS and EPO are, EPS is drier, EPO is, is more oily. So what that basically means is EPS will break up into into dust, popcorn, and EPO will sort of deform and, and bend. So it's a, it's a bit more easy to rework. Um, the advantages of EPS are that you can use black. So LX has a lot of black aircraft, like their B2 and their F-117 and their uh, Su-47 Barkut. Uh, the disadvantage with EPS is that again, it 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 isn't not it isn't nearly as durable, um, and also these days it's more expensive. So um, designing an aircraft to sort of meet modern tastes to be able to take the load that a, that a Raptor could, for example, we need to build it an EPO, which is typically fifteen to twenty percent heavier than EPS, and um, yeah, you just run into a whole bunch of issues. I mean, things, guys, something as 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 absolutely pedantic as imagine a mold. So any of you looking at that article or, or watching that video that I linked to that walks you through the factory, you know, that mold has a big female and a big male. They come together. There's a gap in between them. We inject pressurized foam into that mold. It's called injection molding. Well, the viscosity of that foam that's going into that mold Right. Imagine, imagine trying to inject peanut butter into a into a mold versus into a cookie cutter mold versus, say, you know, water. Water is obviously going to fill up every nook and cranny of your cookie cutter mold yeah. compared to peanut butter. So, but but water might boil off quicker while you cook the cookie. Does that make sense? So there's a there are, we call them recipes because they literally are. There's a recipe for what type of material you're using, how it's injected, at what temperature it's injected into the mold, at, at how long it cooks, so to speak, and all of that. Listeners may be interested to hear a lot of that directly drives sort of the foam quality of a given aircraft. Some airplanes just they just fit better. Um, they're more, they're easier to mold. The F-35, the F-7F, the Raptor. The reason why, one of the reasons why people say, wow, the, the foam is so smooth is because the mold shape turns out to be um, that perfect mathematical uh, number where the, fl- where the foam can float evenly throughout every surface and cook evenly without bubbling or sort of you know, having weird surface issues. So all of that, bringing it back to the Eurofighter, all of that geometry, when you're when you're imagining peanut butter flowing through these really complex molds, um, that directly influences the complexities of making a Eurofighter again, because EPS is easier to make basically what the what shapes the Eurofighter requires compared to 
you know, EPO. So the long answer here is all of that math, all of that worry, that's what people don't really see. And when they say, I want this plane or I want that plane, you know, I have to look at it through that other lens. Can we actually produce it? Is the foam going to get stuck because it's a weird, you know, let's use a real example, the Delta Dart. The Delta Dart has a really has a, has many sharp facets on it. Um, in simulation models, being able to get enough foam up into that, those nooks and crannies mm. uh, is going to be difficult with a conventional EPO mold, unless it's a large, large aircraft, and then you get into that. Well, then it's going to be expensive. So, um, production yeah. eyeglasses. You're right, Shadow. That's uh, that's what I wear. <laughs> I would love. Uh, an F-106. That's just such a cool plane, but that makes sense. I mean, you've got those those uh, hurdles you've got to got to deal with, man. You, you want to make a, an aircraft that people are going to like, because this thing is rugged. This thing is a rugged, solid-built plane. Pretty much all my Mostrin RC planes have, have been so far. And uh, that thoughtfulness uh, definitely comes to fruition, for sure. So, some of the guys were talking about peanut butter. Like, you know, you were talk, kind of talking about that. For me, I love peanut butter too, guys. This, all this peanut butter talk's making me hungry. And of course, my girlfriend doesn't like it. <laughs> so anything peanut butter's all mine. So if I get trapped in here, like it might be for a bit, all the peanut butter stuff is mine. As long as it's chunky, I'll take it. You know, I'm good with either one. Like different times, different moods. Um, I actually like the non-separating one, and then like taking a big old chunk, and then getting like the having that drip off. I'm kind of goofy, I'll, but but I like taking a big old he, big spoon and doing that. Pretty. Yeah, the, the secret is you got to get the the all natural peanut butter that does not have all the sugar in it. Yeah, that's that's what I'm talking about. That's, that's me. Yeah, man. Yeah. Like the Adams or some kind of organic stuff. It's good stuff. Yeah, the good stuff. Almond butters also used to bulk in my earlier days, and that's that's what nice. it lives off of. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Yeah, Dustin totally does Raven Rock Aviation. He's he's uh, got diabetes, so to stabilize his blood sugar, he he's always eating peanut butter. Of course, yeah. we, we, yeah. we that's right, Wesley. We nicknamed our. I think I was calling him. Peter Pan or something, but he's definitely Peter Pan. We called him Jif. I don't know. I can't remember what it was, but it, it was hilarious. I think it was Peter Pan, like Peter Pan peanut butter. But we were doing a Zoom one night, and it was a bunch of us guys just busting each other's balls, and it was great. <laughs> Talking about no RC EQRC. Stuff. You can't you can't put liquid foam into the female and then the male and press. <laughs> doesn't work like EQ, that. EQ, you're <laughs> hilarious, man. And EQ did ask a question earlier that reminds me. What's going on, Wild Bill Flynn? Um, Bill's been talking about crepes on Facebook Messenger to me recently, so he's he's having fun there. He lives up in the foothills below Mount Baker, so check that out on the map, guys, when we're done here, and, and you'll know where, where Wild Bill lives. But uh, EQ cool. was asking about flaps on this thing, and this jet really doesn't need flaps, guys. Um, I land mine just a little bit hotter than than uh, I land my other jets, but it's really not that much faster. And if you come in with a higher angle of attack, make sure you've got enough elevator throw, you're good. It's, it well, slows yeah, also down consider the. I mean, the, the real F-35 had, for all intents and purposes, it had full flan full span flaps it does have sort of micro ailerons on the far outboard but in this scale and the scale of a model um aerodynamically they're not really going to do anything for you so okay again there's there's a reason why we sort of look at how the aircraft is in real life and how does that scale um and and will it will it actually impart any advantage? The F-14 best example I like to use is the T-45 90 millimeter that has leading edge slats. It's the world's first uh, PNP with electrically driven leading edge slats. So we did it, and the reason why we did it is because one we could, and two it actually does uh, uh, slow down the aircraft and sort of help it remain stable at landing speeds. For the F-14 Tomcat that we did shortly thereafter. 
we did not include LEVs or uh, leading edge slats, although we could have. The reason why we didn't is because the prototype that we flew showed us that all it did was add weight and complexity. It didn't actually, it didn't advantage the user in any way. So those are one of those calls we look at, well, are we making a super scale aircraft or are we making a good flying model aircraft? Um, I'm a scale gu guy, everyone knows that, but at the end of the day, I'm always gonna choose the latter. You know, we're, we're designing for something that's gonna fly well in this size. In the context of the F-35, adding ailerons, adding two more servos, more linkages outboard of the wing, it wasn't gonna help us, so, so we didn't do it. <laughs> um, And, and I've found just in real world terms that just, it doesn't really need the flaps. I mean, you make slight adjustments. For me, the biggest adjustment was getting used just to the weight because it flies heavier than the Hawk, the BAE Hawk. Um, yeah. And that thing with the flaps will, will slow to a crawl. Yeah. And there's a reason why, like the F-35, I, I, should, I should be clear here. There, there's four variants of the F-35. The F-35A, which is the one that we chose to depict, yep. it doesn't have ailerons, you know, at all. Um, as the development model, it, it doesn't have ailerons. What you see on the model, on our model, is how the aircraft was set up, at least on the trailing edge. Um, the F-35, the, the Bravo, which is the wider wing variant, someone had asked, you know, are we, why didn't we do that one? It's more RC friendly wider wings, etc. That's got those little smaller ailerons outboard, but again, it comes down to model selection and trying to find that balance. So, uh, it doesn't need it. Frankly, if if you need that aircraft to fly more actually as it already does, something's wrong. <laughs> totally. It's not a drill bit. It's an airplane. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even at 40% dual rates, the thing is a drill bit. I mean, I, I do really tight aileron rolls. Uh, with this at 40% dual rate at the, the recommended throws, or the recommended uh, yeah. uh, holes. Killer jet, yeah. man. Killer jet. So Wesley said, want to have fun set up Televons on your F-35. Or Taylorons, is that what you meant? I think you meant Taylorons. But I'm not sure. I just set up my stuff stock, and I love how this thing flies stock and how it's set up. As long as the CG is far enough forward, that's the critical thing for me, is the CG has to be far enough forward. Yeah. yeah totally, Craig. 100%, man. Sweet. So do you guys want to take a peek at my Mustang that I've got in the back there that I got myself for birth for my birthday? I'm going to go grab that real quick. Alright, so it came with a bunch of different decals and we've got those different versions of the plane and you can paint it and you, if you guys, is this one still in stock, do you know Alpha? I don't, I hope so, but I don't think so. If it's still in stock, guys, this one will be a good one to customize if, if you wanted a tank and wanted to do some customizing. Because you can, it comes with a, basically a bare fuse, right, Alpha? 
Yeah, it's all bare silver. And I'm I'm gonna do an unboxing video with this, so I'm gonna leave everything in here. But you can see, very nice finish. I think this thing is what 130 bucks. I was really yep. surprised. Um, the thing that obviously I, I like my hawk. Oh, those oh we've got a few in stock. Yeah. Yeah, I like my hawk. Uh, I was really surprised at the quality of my. F-105, that uh, the thud. Incredible detail for a $100 plane. Just crazy yep. detail, man. Well, with those, those, those park jets with that series that we're going to be opening up further is the idea was that they're sort of your desktop models. And they're from a big scale static modeler. They're, they're much larger than 132, obviously, but just sort of having something you could have on your desk and bring it in from the garage and actually sort of just have it sitting on top of your laptop. That's that's what I do. All my shelves in my yeah, office man. are all these 64 millimeters. They're that display level. So we wanted to sort of make them sharp and make them, make them sort of look right um, so that people like you, you know, like you said, and thanks, would, would see them and, and, and imagine them. Yeah, that would be something I would like to have on display instead of just waiting in the garage to be looked at once a week. Yeah, well, um, and I've got mine hanging. Uh, one of these streams, not tonight, we're running out of time here, uh, but I've got them hanging. I've got that one hanging at the top. Uh, I've got a bunch of different stuff hanging up, but it's I've got it hanging from my ceiling, um, the F-105, and it just looks so cool up there. Um, and then I've got the, the lippish against the wall. I'm, I'm definitely going to do a tour of one of these uh, streams here pretty quick uh, but not tonight because I know that you probably have to get going here pretty soon my girlfriend's going to be home here any minute but man it's Alrighty. it's Paul thank you for coming here I've been talking to him in some of the other streams you guys I'm addicted to, to streams not just doing it myself but just checking out everyone's streams got some awesome guys doing good stuff out there and try and give him a wrench There you go, Paul. You've got a wrench now. Well, Alpha, thank you very much for your time tonight. Is there anything else that you want? Oh, one other thing I did want to say, actually. Mm -hmm. um, those construction things that are coming, any updates on those? Because I've got, it's under a bunch of Amazon boxes and stuff over there, but I've got mm -hmm. some of the more toyish versions of those Henlu um, construction things. I think that's the brand mm -hmm. that you guys mm -hmm. are having on there. We know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they're awesome. I've got a dump truck and I've got yeah, an we've excavator. Got, well, if you like those, if you like the plastic ones, you're going to love the metal ones that we're bringing in. They're they're two and a half times as heavy. Um, and with with Huina, Huina's been around a while, just like Henlong. But what we really tried to do is sort of pick the best ones and lead with lead with the ones that we can stand behind. Yeah. And so with Huina and some of the other brands that we're bringing in, there we're sort of cherry picking. Um, and we're not trying to get into that market entirely. Just giving people options again. And uh, and yeah, having a 12 pound tank is sort of just as fun as having a 14 pound excavator um, in near scale to each other. So <laughs> the more we can play, uh, the better. I think so. I think so for sure. Man, I had one other thing I wanted to say, but I it just escaped me. Escaped me. We'll have to have you on again sometime soon. Uh, thank you so much for your time, man. You you gave yeah. the audience some incredible details that they're not going to get anywhere else from any other company. So thank you very much for reaching out to me. And guys, thank you very much for giving awesome awesome uh, uh, questions to help uh, keep the chat going along with Alpha and I. You guys, Fred Baird, it's great to see you back in the chat. Thank you so much for that super chat. Uh, George Watts, Dave Marshall, Wild Bill Flynn, Dennis Farley, everybody, Wesley, um, Mary Boozer, of course. Um, thank you very much. And with all that being said, Alpha and GB out. Night, guys.